And today we take the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta. This is Sutta number 135. <clears throat> we find throughout the Majjhima Nikaya, very often suttas are grouped together in pairs. There will be a shorter sutta, which is a shorter sutta is called Chula. Chula means short, and that will be coupled with a Maha Sutta. Maha means big or great. And so there are two suttas which give an analysis of the working of Kama. The shorter, more compact one is called the Chula Kama (coughs) Vibhanga Sutta, which is the one we will take here. Then there's another one which follows it, number 136 called the Maha Kama Vibhanga Sutta, the greater or larger discourse on the exposition or analysis of Kama. I didn't select that one because the argument is rather complicated and I think it's better to just get the fundamental principles <laughs> straight first. But if you want on your own, you can read the Maha Kama Vibhanga Sutta. And one of the, if you remember the account of the Buddha's enlightenment experience, one of the three knowledges that he awakened to on the night of his enlightenment was the knowledge of how beings pass away and take rebirth in accordance with their karma. And as a Buddha, he was able to fathom the working of this karmic law, this law of moral causation, not only in very broad, general terms, as we find in the usual account of his enlightenment knowledge, but in very precise, detailed terms to understand all of these subtle, complicated, interwoven workings of this law of karma. The law of karma was already understood and accepted within the general Indian spiritual environment even before the arising of the Buddha. We don't find the doctrine of karma as such mentioned in the older Brahmanic texts, in the original Vedic texts, in the Brahmanas from a somewhat later period, but in the old Upanishads we already find, which perhaps predate the rise of Buddhism by a hundred years, though some could have even been roughly contemporary with the Buddha, we already find some general recognition of the law of karma, which holds that our rebirth is determined by or governed by our morally significant actions. So what the Buddha accomplished in the understanding of karma is first to be able to discern in so many complex, subtle aspects, the workings of this law. And also, most significantly, the Buddha, we could say, discovered for the first time the really essential and important dynamic factor in the working of karma, which is, above all, the functioning of volition, or chaitanya, will, volition, intention. So in the Buddha's understanding and exposition of the working of karma, what it is that determines the moral significance of an action is the intention or volition that lies behind behind it. 
And it is the ethical quality of our volitions that determine the nature of our actions, determine the functioning of our karma as it brings about its fruits, its results through the working of the process of re- or through the unfolding of the process of rebirth. And in this sutta, the Buddha will give concisely, but in a great amount of detail as to basic principles, some of the most important aspects in the working of karma. And this sutta was given one time when the Buddha was living in the town of Shravasti, in the park of Anattapindika. And it was given to a young Brahmin by the name of Subha, who is described as the son of Todea. Now, there's a little story that lies behind the um, exposition in the sutta. The story comes from the commentary, the classical commentary, to the Majjhima Nikaya. Okay, according to the background of the sutta, this student, young Brahmin student, Subha, was the son of another Brahmin, a prominent Brahmin by the name of Todeya. And at the time the sutta takes place, the Brahmin Todeya had passed away. Now this Todeya had been a very wealthy, very important, powerful and well-established Brahmin. And he was, he had served as a advisor or Purohita means like a chief ceremonial advisor to King Pasenadi, the king of the state of Kosala. And because he performed the religious services and ceremonies for King Pasenadi, King Pasenadi bestowed a great amount of wealth and land and cattle upon him. But Todea had a fault that he was very stingy. He didn't want to part with any of his wealth. He used to think that the wise person keeps his wealth and doesn't give it. Those who practice generosity, giving, charity, are foolish people. And so sometimes the Buddha, when he would, and the monks, when they would go on alms round in the town of Shravasti, they would come to the mansion, the little palace of Todea. And whenever they would come, Todea would say, Sir, go away, go away. We're not giving anything today. (laughs) And so then it happened that Todea had to face the fate of all living beings. He passed away. And when he passed away, Because he was so attached to his mansion, he was reborn to one of the dogs that was living on the property, one of the (laughs) watchdogs. And so he became a dog himself. And then when the dog reached its mature age, again when the Buddha came to beg for alms at the house, the dog would growl at him. (laughs) But the Buddha knew, because he was able with his super human faculty to understand the karmic, uh, the working of the law of karma, so he knew that this dog was the, formerly the Brahmin Todeya, So one time when the Buddha came to the house alone, the dog came out and growled at him, go away, (laughs) he was saying, go away, go away, there's nothing to be given here. (laughs) So the Buddha said to him, and some servants were standing around watching, the Buddha said, Todea, you used, when when you were a human being, you used to chase me away, and now that you're a dog, again you're still chasing me away. And when the Buddha said that to this dog, the dog got up or walked away. It went into a corner 
where there was a kind of heap of ashes from the fireplace and just curled up and it wouldn't eat anything and it wouldn't move away from that heap of ashes. Even though the Brahmins, the young Brahmin Suba used to have a very beautiful bed for the dog and it used to feed it very delicious food. The dog just curled up and remained there. And the Buddha went on back to his, continued on his arm trial. So then, when Suba, the young Brahmin, tried to get the dog without success to get it to come back and to become happy and active again, he asked the servants what had happened and the servants reported to him that the Buddha had referred, had been there and had referred to the dog as by the name of his father. He called him Todeya. And so Suba was very upset by this, very angry. So he went to the monastery and said to the Buddha, What are you doing, sir, calling my dog by the name of my father? That's outrageous. You know my father was a very prominent Brahmin in the service of King Pasenadi. And since he was a prominent Brahmin, he's been reborn in the Brahma world. He's now a very important, prominent deity in the Brahma world. And the Buddha said, I don't want to disappoint you, young man, (laughs) but that dog, your dog, is your father. Then Suba said, how do you know that? The Buddha said, I know. He said, how can you prove such stupid, such ridiculous statements? Then the Buddha said, I'll tell you a little test. You know that your father didn't leave his full estate to you. You know that there's quite a lot of his treasury which can't be accounted for and which he's hidden away someplace, buried someplace, deep in some underground vault. So this is the test. You take your dog, you prepare some piacin. Do you know what piacin is? It's an Indian dish of it's a very fine rice porridge. The rice is boiled in milk. Then it's mixed with honey, nuts, raisins. It becomes very delicious. So you prepare a dish of piacin for your dog. <laughs> Get him nice and well fed on the piacin. Then the dog, after he eats, he'll be get drowsy and lie down to take a nap. As soon as he falls off into sleep, say to him, Father, show me where the treasure is buried. (laughs) And you do that and see what happens. (laughs) Okay, so Suba did what was instructed. Dog fell off, ate the pipes, (laughs) went off, curled up, fell into sleep. And as soon as Suba saw that the dog was asleep, he went up to him and said, (laughs) so he was reluctant to do this, but he said, Father, show me where the treasure is buried. The dog got up from sleep, walked over to the foot of the tree, started digging up the ground a little bit, then walked off. And Suba got some of his workers, they digged up that spot under the tree, and sure enough, there was the treasure. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know how reliable these stories are. <laughs> they come in commentaries and whether they actually report historical events or <laughs> preachers several hundred years later had to make the content of their sermons entertaining and interesting to village people so they could have invented the stories. So I, I can't testify to their truth, to their reliability, but this is the story. So when Suba saw that his dog directed him to the treasure, then he realized that the Buddha must be a speaker of truth. And then he went to him, he made up some questions of some issues that had been weighing on his mind. And he went to him and he asked the questions. And the questions are what take, make up paragraph three here. So Suba comes and says, What is the cause and condition 
why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? That is the general question. Then the more specific modalities of the question. For people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, low-born and high-born, stupid and wise. What is the cause and condition, Master Gautama, why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? So we could see this for ourselves. It's quite quite an obvious matter that there's a great deal of differentiation between human beings. Even we have societies which are purportedly egalitarian, like in well, in the former communist bloc, they used to say all human beings are created equal, so all will be living at the same level, except <laughs> some human beings are more equal than others, <laughs> and so they need a greater share of the uh, wealth of the country in order to be able to work more effectively for the uplift and welfare of the people. And so we saw in the Soviet Union, in communist China during the Maoist period, though everybody went around wearing the same drab clothing, but some people had quite luxurious imported cars, others had no means of transportation except bicycles. Some people lived in quite luxurious mansions. Others had to be living whole families, seven, eight people living in a single room. <clears throat> Some people eating quite sumptuous food, maybe three, four, five, six course meals. Other people in the same egalitarian society of subsisting day after day on maybe in Russia, potatoes and cabbage, China on just rice and one vegetable. So we see this difference in the fortune of human beings. Even, well, America is supposedly now an egalitarian country, but people, some people becoming few people, becoming more and more wealthy, more and more powerful. Other people who previously were able to count on job security, now getting discharge notices. Other people having to subsist on jobs which are far below their qualifications. It's not too bring in karma as a justification for this, but this is one explanatory factor for the difference amongst human beings. So the Buddha says, now answering the question in a general way, he says, and this is what we call the general statement of the law of karma, that beings, living beings, are owners of their actions. And here the word translated actions is the Pali word karma, Sanskrit karma which has a somewhat richer meaning than the English word action. So the word kama, it comes from the root kar, which means to do. In other words, it's deed. But it's actions or deeds considered as having some ethical significance. We could call it ethically determinative actions. So beings are owners of their actions. That is, whatever deeds we perform, good or bad, that is what we truly possess, what is truly our own. We say that even the houses we live in, though we might have property deeds for them, they're not our own. The clothes we wear, not our own. They wear out and have to be given up. Wife and children... They're not our own. They make up their own minds, go their own way. Even this body, not our own. The body dies. But when we have to pass away, what do we take with us? 
only the good and bad deeds that we've performed. So we are the owners of our actions and we are the heirs of our actions. That is, we inherit our good and bad actions from life to life. Then the actions are the yoni, the womb or mode of origin from which living beings originate. They are the kinsmen or relative to which we are bound, so we're never separated from our kama. And the kama is our kama is our refuge, what we have to rely upon to move upward within the round of rebirths. We can't rely on other people not even upon very accomplished spiritual teachers, but what we really can fall back on, what we have to rely upon, are our own actions. So in that way, Kama is our refuge. And it's Kama which differentiates beings into the inferior and superior. So when the Buddha said this, then Subha, did not understand the meaning because the Buddha's statement was very general. So he asked the Buddha if he would give a more detailed explanation of his statement. And now the Buddha is going to explain 14 different types of kama or or 14 different courses of kama which fall into seven contrasting pairs seven pairs of opposites. These are courses which lead to different types of results, good results and bad results. But now before we actually explain these different pairs of karma, I want to introduce the distinction and types of karma that is provided by the commentary to the sutta from the the Majjhima Nikaya commentary. And this is a distinction which it's perhaps it was devised by the ancient masters of Buddhist doctrine. Perhaps it comes from the Buddha himself, though this particular classification of four types of karma, we don't find it in the suttas, but it provides a very helpful explanatory scheme for understanding how karma works. And so the commentators distinguish four different types of karma or four different ways in which karma functions. Okay, the first of these is called oppressive karma. This is karma, action, which brings misfortune and which destroys, during the, during the course of one's lifetime, it destroys wealth that one might have already acquired or it makes enjoyment, it sort of sours one's enjoyment, makes it difficult to find enjoyment. And it causes difficulties and problems through the entire course of one's life. Like we see some people, maybe they are born into positions of wealth and not through their own fault. If they are sort of negligent and they make bad choices, then, of course, we could say that they're immediately responsible for the loss of their wealth. But some people even though they make an effort to preserve the wealth or to acquire more wealth, but somehow everything goes against them. And so they just, maybe they lose their job, they make bad investments, or the firms that they invest in collapse. Um, And so they meet all sorts of difficulties and problems in the course of their life. So this, when this happens, we could understand that this is 
happening, if it's, it could be happening through their own choices and decisions here and now. But it could also be, even though that, in that case, when it's happening through their own choices and decisions here and now, then we have to say that they are at fault in the present. It's not necessarily the working out of previous karma. But if they are making every effort, say, to be successful, but all of their efforts come to nothing, apparently through no fault of their own, but just it seems almost like there's a conspiracy (laughs) in outside circumstances against them. Everything is working against them. We could say people who are almost seem to be born losers, or even if they're not born that way, but when they reach maturity, everything goes against them. Then this is, we can draw the inference that this is coming through the operation of some kind of past unwholesome comma, which has taken on the role of oppressive comma. So it's now blocking out good fortune and bringing them all sorts of troubles and difficulties. The second, this is called destructive comma, or you could maybe render the term terminative comma. In the Pali, it's upachetika. Upachetika means cutting off. And this is a special type of comma which cuts off the lifespan prematurely. Now, it might be the case that a person is born with some good karma generating that rebirth. Good karma which tends to produce a long lifespan. But the working of karma, it's very complex. So it's like every karma is like a vector force pushing in a different direction. So even though a person might have a karma, might be reborn through a karma that tends to bring a long lifespan, but that person might have also done some past very strong unwholesome action which has the function, if it gets the opportunity, it will perform the function of cutting off the lifespan prematurely so the person will die young even in the prime of life. This can be the case. The commentary uses a simile. It's like somebody shoots an arrow into the air and by the force of the momentum from that shot of the arrow, the arrow might be moving in the direction of, say, a hundred meters. But somebody is down below and as soon as that man shoots the arrow, he takes a stone and throws it up and hits the arrow. So it hits the arrow in mid-flight and the arrow falls to the ground. So we can see perhaps this karma operative in the cases, say, of soldiers who go into battle and are killed when they're in their 20s. People who are killed in automobile accidents, plane crashes, people who contract some fatal illness when they're in the prime of life and die very quickly. Okay, the third type of karma is the karma that produces, that's directly responsible for producing the actual rebirth. And how this is an important point that is not often understood. According to the way of interpreting the Buddha's suttas, I think this can be taken directly from the suttas, but it's really worked out in detail in the Abhidharma or the philosophical exposition of the teaching. The mode of rebirth that we undergo, it's not just a general cross-section of all the karmas that we've done in the course of our life, but rather, at the time of death, 
all the karmas that we've performed, in a sense, jostle for position. What's the term? Jostle, or they sort of jockey each other for position. They all are, in a sense, competing to take over the role of producing rebirth. I find this, maybe there's an analogy for this in the actual process of biological conception. So that when, say, the woman is fertile and the man has sexual relations with her and then the sperm come to the vicinity of the egg, the the ovum, it's not that the egg will be fertilized by some compromise between all the different sperms with their own particular codes of genetic information. So that like the sperms get together and say, let's each chip in some of our own genes and that way we will all contribute to the fertilization of the egg. But rather it's just one of the sperms will sort of outdo the others, outrush the others. Or when they're all competing to enter the ovum to fertilize it, only one will take on that role. And once that one succeeds, then all the others lose their efficacy and don't fertilize it. So a similar thing happens at the time of death. All the different commas that we perform are up there running and struggling to take on that role of producing the rebirth. And it is only the strongest, the most capable karma that will take on that role. Sometimes it will be an extremely powerful karma that a person has performed in the course of their life. Sometimes, in most cases, it will be a habitual action, an action which has become deeply ingrained in the mind. Sometimes it will be an action which is performed very close to the time of death, but might be rather different from the actions that we generally perform in the course of our life. So, for example, we might take the case sometimes of a person who has been consistently nasty and mean-minded in the course of his life. But then as maybe as death approaches, this person considers and reflects, oh, what have I done with my life? I've been so cruel or unconsiderate of others. Oh, if I could only live my life anew, I would really change. And then let me think now what I can do in these last few moments to change the lives of others. And so then this person might suddenly decide, writing out the will, or he might say, change the will, I want to donate such and such to some charity and help poor people or sick people. And so that one action then, as death comes, that action might come into the mind and that will produce a good rebirth, a very happy rebirth, But it doesn't mean that the person escapes that accumulation of bad karma through all of the nasty and mean deeds that he or she performed. But those karmas also remain stored up and they will produce their results when they get the opportunity. But here now, because there has been a very powerful karma, positive karma at the time of death, that directs the rebirth process. And sometimes it comes in the opposite way. A very good person might suddenly become overcome by nasty thoughts or selfish thoughts or resentful thoughts. Then that could bring a bad rebirth. Again, it doesn't mean that the person won't reap the fruits of their good deeds, but just that a bad karma, some bad mental formation has come up at the time of death. And that will govern the rebirth process. And this is why it's very important to cultivate the mind in the course of one's life. So as death comes upon us, we don't get 
overrun by unwholesome thoughts swelling up from below. But if those thoughts tend to come up, then we can overpower them with the force of a strong, wholesome, virtuous mind. Okay, so this is the generative karma, the karma that produce, that actually produces the mode of rebirth. Then the fourth type of karma is called supportive karma. Karma that brings success in the course of life. Karma that removes obstacles and attracts good fortune. We see some people maybe they have been born into a very poor family in a poor country and just somehow all sorts of conditions just suddenly crystallize in their favor so that they might become very reach very important position, become very eminent, prominent, with very little effort, they become wealthy, whatever they undertake, succeed, they become easily very successful. And so when this happens, I mean, sometimes it happens through strong personal effort and initiative here and now. But sometimes you see, you might have ten people who are making the same amount of effort, but for nine of them, the doors close. They come to apply for the job. The interviewer says, (laughs) thank you for applying. If we need you, we'll give you a call. (laughs) But when the tenth person comes in, they say, ah, you are just the person we want. Please come and start work on Monday. (laughs) Okay, so these are four types of karma. And we use this scheme as an explanatory, or we use this, these distinctions as an explanatory scheme for interpreting the working of karma according to the sutta. Okay, so now we come to the actual analysis of the different courses of karma. I've taken one for treatment in detail, the others only we've taken brief. The one that we take in detail is the course of action, the courses of action that lead to short life and to long life. That's the first one in this in, uh, in the initial statement. Okay, so the Buddha says, Here, O student, Some man or woman kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, giving to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he appears in a state of deprivation. A state of deprivation, I've explained this term before. We might also translate this, the plane of misery or the apaya. These are the three lower realms. The realm of the animals, the realm of the pratas, the hungry ghosts or unhappy spirits, and the hell realm. So this person reappears in a state of deprivation in an unhappy destination in perdition. Again, the terms are all synonymous. Even in hell. Hell is the lowest of the unfortunate rebirth. Okay, now, using the classification given by the commentary, the act of killing and being merciless and cruel to living beings, if that takes on the role of generative karma, 
if it directly takes on the role of producing rebirth, it brings rebirth in the plane of misery, in hell. That is, in that very nature of all unwholesome karma, any unwholesome karma, when it produces rebirth, it has to produce rebirth in a lower form of existence. An unwholesome karma cannot bring rebirth in the human realm or in any of the celestial realms. And according to the Majjhimani commentary, uh, before I explain this point, we have to explain that yeah, this is an important fact to understand. Now, the way Buddhism analyzes the mind, it doesn't see the mind as being one stable, lasting entity. But what we call the mind is a sequence or current of ever-changing, constantly changing, arising and passing away. It's a sequence or current of frames of mind, states of mind, which are always arising, passing away. So we speak about the mind as being one entity which goes, remains the same, going from point A to point B. According to the early Buddhist understanding, that is something of a delusion. (laughs) So the way we ordinarily understand ourselves We think we have the same mind from, let us say, 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. (laughs) On every day, then we think (coughs) the same mind throughout the years from 2002 to 2003, or could be from (laughs) 1950 (laughs) to 2003, if we get to be that old. Same mind. No, cha- of course, they are changing thoughts, but the mind really the same. But the way Buddhism see- sees the mind, even within a split second, from five o'clock point o o o p.m. to five o'clock point o o one p.m. That's one. Ten hundred thousandth of a second, or even smaller, smaller, smaller. There are many, many. I just threw one, two, three, four, five, six, something like nine or ten states of mind. But according to the text, they say millions of of states of mind arise and pass away just in the snap of a finger, snap of the fingers. And within those states of mind, each state each state of mind is called technically a chitta. With an active mind, the state of consciousness. Within that state of mind, one of the most important elements or factors is the factor of volition or in Pali, Chaitana. It's the volition which motivates the action and which executes the action. So that when somebody is, as the text says, murder, when somebody kills living beings, what does the killing, what executes the act of killing is this mental factor volition. And so in one single act of killing, say, there will be many, many states of mind arising. 
And each mind, each state of mind will have that mental factor volition, executing, motivating, driving the act of killing. And if it is the volition that is directly responsible for that act of killing that takes on the role of generating rebirth, that will produce the rebirth in the lower realm. But it might be the case that this person who has at some time killed living beings, for example, somebody in his youth might have been enjoyed hunting, fishing, or even killed human beings. But then they might undergo a change of heart later in life and they become very soft, hearted, compassionate, kindly, give up the killing, practice of killing. They might adopt the precept to abstain from killing. And it might be that they generate very good, wholesome karma. So in this case, the wholesome karma can take on the role of producing rebirth. And it will produce, it might produce, say, a human rebirth. And it might be a karma even with the tendency to produce a human rebirth with a long lifespan. So the person might be, by reason of the strength of the rebirth consciousness, that person might have the tendency, the sort of inner karmic strength to live for 80, 85, 90 years. But it can be the case that these previous karmas of killing that took place in youth, in the person's youth, in the course of that person's life as a human being, they might come to fruition and they can, they might, one of them might take on the role of a destructive karma. Particularly, I would say, if that person in the earlier life had killed a human being. It's very possible that that bad karma could have been waiting, sort of like a murderer hiding behind the curtain, waiting for the opportunity to strike. When it gets the opportunity, like the murderer in the cheap drama, pulls aside the curtain, pulls out the knife, and ah, there, cuts off the person's lifespan. So, take somebody like you know, like President Kennedy. So much powerful good karma to become <laughs> the President of the United States. And at the height of his, his youth, well, not youth, but he's at the prime of his powers, very popular with the people, well liked by many people, very influential then that destructive karma is hiding someplace and as he drives down the avenue in Dallas it strikes him and then he's dead in his still was in the 40s in his 40s so the unwholesome karma that's done can lead to a short lifespan by taking on the role of destructive karma or else Say if there's an accumulation of less powerful types of unwholesome karma of killing, say somebody who just likes to hunt, kill deer and other larger animals, then those unwholesome actions might take on the role of oppressive karma. They can obstruct the working of the karma tending to a long lifespan. So even if the person has that tendency to a long lifespan, but the constant oppression 
by the oppressive karma, by the impeding karma, or the constant interference by the oppressive karma can impede the strength of that long life karma that the person then might become vulnerable to some illness and then they, their lifespan is shortened. So instead of living for the full 80 years, they might die at the age of 60, 65, maybe heart attack, stroke, some other illness. And so in this way, the unwholesome karma leads to a short lifespan. Okay, then we take the opposite case now. Okay, so we see here in the sutta, if on the dissolution of the body after death, okay, well, actually we first, we've taken the case where his karma leads to rebirth in an unhappy destination. That will be if the karma of killing takes on the role of generating rebirth, it leads to rebirth in the unhappy realms, the unfortunate realms. But now we have the case, if he does not reappear in one of the lower realms, but instead comes back to the human state, he comes to the human state through good karma, wholesome karma. But he is reborn, but when he's reborn in the human realm, he has a short lifespan. That can be through the destructive karma, some unwholesome karma which takes on the destructive role, or else some various um, oppressive karmas which prevent his rebirth karma from bringing, from leading to a long lifespan. Okay, now we take the opposite case. Here, some man or woman abandons the killing of living beings and abstains from killing living beings. With weapon, rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, they abide compassionate towards all living beings. Okay, this is now creating very powerful wholesome karma. Okay, because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, this person reappears, is reborn in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. Okay, now, when one refrains from, if one refrains from taking life just because one is not temperamentally inclined towards, say, hunting, fishing, or one never gets angry at another human being, it's so angry that one wants to kill that person, that in itself is not really such a powerful, wholesome karma. But here we're thinking or taking the case of a person who deliberately, through an act, an intentional act, has decided, I am not going to harm or kill living beings. And this person takes, undertakes either a formally a precept or else a personal guiding principle of not killing or harming living beings. And then not only do they abstain from killing, but they develop an attitude, a mental outlook, which is gentle and kind, suffused with compassion. And so now this person is permeating the mind, He's on specific occasions, permeating the mind with states of loving kindness and compassion. So this is generating wholesome, good karma. Now, if that the good karma involved in those thoughts of refraining from the destruction of life or generating thoughts of kindness and compassion towards others, if those states of mind take on the role of producing rebirth, they will directly, on their own, produce 
either rebirth in one of the heavenly realms or else they will produce rebirth in the human realm with the tendency inherent in the rebirth consciousness to enjoy a long life. It's quite important (laughs) if we want to live a long time to understand this. But it can be the case that this karma, this action of refraining from the destruction of life on its own does not take on the role of generating rebirth. In other words, it doesn't become a karma of type 3, the generative karma, janaka karma. But instead, some other karma will produce the rebirth in the human realm. But then this wholesome karma of refraining from killing, the karma of kind and compassionate thoughts, will then play the role of supporting karma. This karma will bring about good fortune to the being during his human lifespan. In other words, it will reinforce or support the wholesome karma that has produced the human rebirth and it will remove obstacles and affliction that might beset that person. And thereby, it will tend to promote a long lifespan in the human world. And here we come to this point that's made in the commentary that the action or karma that takes on the generative role, the role of producing rebirth, this will be the volition that determines or decides I am going to refrain from the destruction of life. I'm going to avoid harming other living beings. I'm going to live compassionate and kindly towards others. Those thoughts or states of mind, if they become operative at the time of death, or I should say, since it's singular, if one of those thoughts becomes operative at the time of death, it will produce rebirth either in the heavenly world or with a long lifespan in the human world. But if it is one of the preceding or subsequent thoughts, let let us say the preceding and subsequent volitions or thoughts, the thoughts leading up to that decision to abstain from the destruction of life. Or afterwards, after one makes that determination, the sort of thoughts that reflect upon one's decision and approve of it. Those thoughts don't take on the generative role, but they will take on the supportive role and they will promote the tendency inherent in the rebirth consciousness for long life and they will remove obstacles to a long lifespan. Okay, this is a detailed treatment of these first two courses of karma. Now, the others really just pretty much follow the same pattern, so we could just go over them very quickly. Okay, here I have them arranged on the outline the paths that lead to poor health and good health. Okay, somebody is by nature cruel. He doesn't actually make it a habit of taking life, but they injure other living beings with weapons, even with their hands. So if that 
karma of injuring others takes on the rebirth generative role it will produce a rebirth in a bad destination. But if that karma doesn't take on the rebirth generative role, it will become, you know, press, say if the person is reborn as a human being through some good karma, but that karma of harming others will come to manifestation by causing persistent bad health, various health problems. So in the course of that person's life, they will have all sorts of <laughs> incurable health problems. And so when one investigates what is the cause of this, then one traces it back to some karma in past lives of injuring and afflicting other living beings. On the other hand, somebody deliberately refrains from injuring others. Again, this would be a person who dwells kindly, compassionate. If that karma, that mind of avoiding injury to others takes on the rebirth generative role, it will produce rebirth either in the heavenly realm or as a human being with the karmic disposition to good health. But if that karma doesn't directly take on the role of generating the rebirth, but some other good karma produces rebirth in the human realm, then that wholesome karma of non not injuring or harassing other beings will function in the supportive role. So it will tend to remove different um, threats to good health and support that person's good health. Okay, then we have next the path leading to ugliness and beauty. <laughs> it seems this is sort of based upon projection from the effects of one's mental attitude upon one's facial features right here and now. So we take a person who is temperamentally angry and irritable. So even if they're criticized a little bit, they become very angry, angry and resentful. They seem to be upset and angry under any conditions, even the slightest provocation. And so we could see right here and now when a person gets angry, their facial features become tight, Cram, unpleasant, disagreeable. And that leaves its impression on the consciousness so that that consciousness, when it generates rebirth, will tend to produce very rough, crude features. Whereas if somebody is always patient, forbearing, tolerant, then you could see that their face right now has pleasant features, always a pleasant smile. And then that disposition in the consciousness to produce pleasant facial features, when if that consciousness takes on the rebirth generating role, the person will have pleasant features, beautiful appearance but I think one has to be a little bit careful careful here. But sometimes some people, I don't know why, but the facial features might be rough, even intimidating. But when you get to know the person, they're really very pleasant, very soft, very agreeable, likable, sometimes very gentle. Say the, so you can't judge a book by its cover. Whereas other people, they might have always a very pleasant, sweet smile, very bright, shiny features, but they can be. (laughs) There was a song, was it it an Elvis Presley song? Looks like an angel, speaks like an angel, (laughs) walks like an angel, but she's a devil in disguise. (laughs) Was that a 1950s Elvis song? (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, so those are two courses leading to ugliness and beauty. But I'm rather hesitant to make too many judgments on a person's past by way of their superficial facial features. Okay, then, paragraph 11. Well, here we come to the paths leading to being influential and to lack of influence. Okay, the person who is envious and resentful of gain, honor, respect, and given to others, this type of mind the envious and resentful mind lead to rebirth in conditions where one is uninfluential. One is a very weak, powerless person. But the kind of person who is without envy, who doesn't begrudge the gains, honor, respect received by others, the person who rejoices in the good fortune of others, this person, when they come back to the human state, wherever they are reborn, they are influential. So it says, but I have to say, when I think of some of the most prominent long-term senators, congressmen, <laughs> and wonder in their previous life, or at least in their immediately previous life, were they really so <laughs> um, open-minded, gentle-hearted to rejoice in the good fortune of others? I don't know. <laughs> but maybe we can see these as general tendencies. And also we have to realize that the process of rebirth extends over many, many lives, not just two lives in immediate succession. Definitely, we have to take account also of the factors inherited from the mother and father. But also, this raises the question, why are some people um, reborn as the children of a particular set of parents. And one would have to say that if one looks at it from a very distant perspective, which can see all of many of the factors involved, you would say that what draws a person towards a particular family as the locus of rebirth is that that couple or that family situation provides the appropriate karmic conditions for that for the ripening of the karmic tendencies that that person is bringing with them into the new life. Okay, the next, the courses leading to poverty and wealth. Okay, so the person who is generous, who gives the material requisite to <laughs> aesthetics or brothels, <laughs> um, If that person comes back, okay. Oh, here the person is stingy, I'm sorry, okay, the person who is selfish and miserly, they do not give the basic requisites to the ascetics or Brahmins who are the main field of merit. That action, if it leads back to the human state, will tend to bring poverty. Whereas the person who is generous and who provides the ascetics and Brahmins with their material requisites, that karma of generosity will tend to produce wealth and material success. Well, we'll just go through the rest quickly, then we can have some discussion. Then, okay, the person who is very arrogant and obstinate and who does not show proper respect to others. This is a person who 
if they come back to the human state, then they will be reborn in the low families. We have to remember in India at this period, there was a very rigid, static social structure. Whereas the person who is shows respect and veneration towards those who are worthy of veneration, that type of karma will tend to bring rebirth into high families in the Indian social structure into rebirth amongst the kshatriyas or noble class or the brahmins. Okay, then the person who does not approach wise recluses and brahmins and ask what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what should be what kind of action should be cultivated, what should be avoided, this person will tend to be stupid. Not necessarily intellectually stupid, but the person won't have a proper sense of moral values, a sense of ethical direction. Whereas the person who visits ascetics and brahmins, asks questions, listens to spiritual teachings, this person will acquire some understanding of what should be undertaken, what should be avoided, what leads to one's real welfare and happiness, what leads to pain and suffering. And so the Buddha sums up the discourse saying that he is taught the way that leads to short life, the way that leads to long life, the way that leads to sickliness or poor health, the way that leads to good health, the way that leads to ugliness, to beauty, to lack of influence, to being influential, the way that leads to poverty, the way that leads to wealth, the way that leads to low birth, the way that leads to high birth, the way that leads to stupidity, the way that leads to wisdom. And so the Buddha says, this in effect is what I meant when I said that Beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. And when he completes the discourse, then the Brahmin student Subha forgets his resentment against the Buddha and then takes refuge in the Triple Gem and becomes a lay follower of the Buddha. Okay, that is the discourse. If any questions, any comments? Yeah. 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 I mean, the workings of karma are extremely complex. And so, even in a sutta like this, one can't expect the Buddha to cover all of the complex operations of karma. But here I'd say what he's done is to just show some principal um, tendencies in the working of karma. In fact, in the next sutta, the next sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, which is called the Longer Discourse on the Workings of Kama. The Buddha takes the case, he actually, in that sutta, he rejects the idea, the thesis, that anyone who performs wholesome karma is reborn in the heavenly realm or even in the human realm. Or that anyone who does bad karma is reborn in one of the bad realms. That's what brings in the complications. He brings in the cases where one might see in a, a, an ascetic who has this deep samadhi and develops the divine eye, he might see somebody performing good karma and then taking rebirth and health. 
And he might see another person who performs bad karma and gets reborn in the heavenly world. And that person might that contemplative might then come to the conclusion that the working of karma is completely chaotic. If one does bad actions, one gets a good rebirth. If one does good actions, one gets a bad rebirth. But the Buddha says that this is because that person hasn't understood that there are some karmas which take on, which are operative in producing rebirth, others, other karmas which just remain in a dormant role for some time until they gain the opportunity. So. Yeah. He's speaking to the Buddha, but right. yeah, this is just a polite way in Indian. Is, is, it, is it a polite way in Indian? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I noticed in the some languages actually five persons. Yeah. In the second person, you yeah. have to do it in the third person. Even in, the, in, even in India? Even in India today, or even in Sri Lanka, it's in the old style of expression, maybe some of the younger generation, like when we speak to say an older monk, we don't say, will you be going into town today, but will Bhante be going into town today? (laughs) Or else, when one speaks to another person, one doesn't use the second person singular, but the second person plural. We don't have the distinction in English, but in Pali, it would be instead of saying Tvang, we say Tumhe. Any other questions or comments? There's one rather dangerous tendency I could see in the karma doctrine that it could almost, in fact, it is used in this way. Be used as a way of sort of justifying the status quo in a rather rigidly, rigidly stratified society. So that, well, Brahmins used it in this way to justify the class, caste structure of Indian society. And even, <laughs> I have to say, in a Buddhist society like Sri Lanka, there is pretty, at least traditionally, strict caste system (laughs) which developed not through directly through Buddhist influence but through the influence of India. And so the general view of people is that the reason why some were born in families of the, say, the Radhala, the Radhala is like the aristocratic family, that is the fruition of their good karma, Others are born as Rodias, Rodias are the, almost like the outcast, that is through the working out of bad karma. And so it's um, a high degree of separation is preserved to maintain between people of a different caste, very specific rules of etiquette in relating people of different castes. And even, well, this is rather embarrassing for the Buddhist order, but one of the three, one of the, yeah, one of the three main Buddhist sects in Sri Lanka would not give the full higher ordination, the bhikkhu ordination, to people who were born outside of the well-established agricultural class on the ground that they don't have the right karmic accumulation for the, um, to take the full ordination. But the two other Buddhist lineages, the Buddhist sects in Sri Lanka, originated because people from the other social classes wanted to take the full ordination, and so they came to the centers from of the main sect, the original sect. This is the Siamnikaya. 
They said, please, may we take higher ordination? And the high priest would say to them, well, you are very fortunate to receive the Salman era, the novice ordination. <laughs> now, you don't have to think about taking the higher ordination in this life. Just do acts of merit in this life, and then in your next life you will be reborn <laughs> into the Govikama class, that's the agricultural the cultivating class, and then you can take the higher ordination. And so they weren't satisfied with that, and so one group went to Upper Burma and took ordination there, and then came back and established the Amarapura Nikaya in Sri Lanka. Another group went to southern Burma and took the ordination there, and then came back and established the third Nikaya, third order in Sri Lanka, the Ramanya Nikaya. But I have to say also in Burma and Thailand, both the, actually in Thailand also the social structure is pretty rigidly stratified, or at least there is an an aristocracy, an upper crust, and then the general population. And there's one of the Buddhists ordination lineage is I think they pretty much reserve ordination in that school to those from the upper echelons of society. But the other order will receive people from any social group. In Burma, I think that there's very little social discrimination in that way. About China? <laughs> no, no, no. Mm-hmm. Actually, actually, the so- Chinese social structure had a very high degree of mobility because of the system of examinations, imperial examinations. So anybody with intelligence and initiative from the simplest peasant family who studied very diligently could take the imperial examinations and if they succeed, work their way up into the direct advisors to the nobility. I think it's mainly the influence of that the Indian cultural sphere is what tends to propagate the ideas of a rigid social structure. Okay, any questions based on... Another point I should make that if one is, say, reborn in rather limiting conditions through one's past karma, it doesn't mean that one is a perpetual victim, a perennial victim of one's past. Because the other point of, influ- of emphasis in the Buddha's teaching is that through our present karma, we can transform our destiny. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, This is a a very important difference between the Brahminic view of karma and rebirth and the Buddhistic view. Both would see one's present status as being determined to some extent by one's past karma. But the Brahmins would say that this karmic order is a kind kind of divinely ordained order. So when you are reborn into a particular social group, you have your call the swabhava, your social duties, your caste duties, your class duties. And to work your way up in the karmic system, you have to fulfill the duties which are binding upon members of this social class. So somebody who is born as a shudra, a laborer, shouldn't have any aspiration to become a scholar, say, or a government official or a warrior, but should just fulfill the duties of a laborer, farmer, whatever, and then 
Through that, they will generate, create the good karma that will bring a more fortunate rebirth. But the Buddha says that wealth, poverty, high birth, low birth, these are conditioned by karma, but they're not, they don't impose limiting conditions upon a person. But a person who is even reborn, say, into a poor family through initiative, effort, can work their way up and become a wealthy, successful merchant or businessman. And if he does so, that's quite appropriate. And somebody who has the ability to, say, exercise governmental function might be able to work their way up into the administrative system and become an administrator. And then the most important point is that anybody who is inspired to follow the path of Dhamma can follow it to the very end and reach liberation. Whereas in the Brahminic view, to reach the final goal, I think in some sources say one has to be reborn in the Brahmin caste. Other sources, I think, have a more liberal view that if one is reborn into the three upper classes, Brahmin, Kshatriya, or Vaishya, Vaishya is the mercantile class. Did you have some another question or point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, taking the context of that time, yeah. that who should have stopped the Buddhism to be all of the lower classes and women. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? yeah. But when I read the sutra, yeah. I hear always talking about Brahmin. And I ask people to It's funny. Yeah, um... <laughs> It is. <laughs> so the Buddha did have followers from actually what the main supporters of the Buddha in the sense of those who gave gifts to the order, who gave parks to the order to establish monasteries, who built the structures, who provided the alms, food for the Buddha, for people from the mercantile class what they call the Gahapati, Rihaspati, the householders, people who were landowners, small landowners, or some, in some cases, wealthy landowners, businessmen, bankers. But this Uma Chakravarti, the social dimensions of early Buddhism, it's a book, very, very interesting and insightful book, she has tables in the back in which she took the cases of members of the monk's order, nun's order, and lay devotees of the Buddha who were mentioned by name and class in the suttas, in the Nikayas. She found that those in the order of monks and nuns who were mentioned by class name or by class identity the greatest number are from the Brahmin caste. Yeah. Even Sariputra, Mogalana, Mahakasapa, Mahakachayana, Brahmins, they're Brahmin names. The Kasapa brothers, Kasapa, this is his Brahmin last name. And then, of course, the Buddha's relatives from the Kshatriyas became many of them became ordained as monks. Similarly, the order of nuns, many kshatriyas. Brahmins, I don't know. Because Brahmins kept very firm hold over their women. They didn't give them much chance to make their own decisions. But then, the lay supporters, largely from the Kahapati class, the, the householder class, and the Buddha, what's interesting, what this Uma Chakrabarti points out, when the Buddhist texts are describing the social order as it exists in India, they follow the fourfold system of the Brahmin. Brahmins, Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, or Vaishyas, mercantile, cultivating class, and Sudras, the labor class. But when the Buddha is describing a social order from his own viewpoint, 
he still has the Kshatriyas, but the Kshatriyas first, Brahman second, because he has to give, I think it would have been too revolutionary for him to depose the Brahmins entirely. And also they did have their own unique functions within the social system. But then the others he refers to as simply everyone else as Kahapati, is just householders. And even the Brahmins very often are described in ways which show that they were not performing special religious functions, but they become Brahmana Kahapati, householder Brahmin. Yeah, 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 of householder Brahmins, Brahma, Brahmana Kahapati. Any, any further questions, comments? Okay, then we will stop tonight. And next time, actually next time, the first sutta is addressed to a village of householder Brahmins. That's the Saleya Sutta, number 41. And if possible, maybe I'll try to get two suttas in. Then I might also try to get in number, I think it's 120. It can be done very simply, 120. It's basically just one pattern which repeats itself. Okay, so try to read both suttas by next time. Okay, we share the mirror. Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahitika Punyantang anomo ditva chirang rakam tu sasanam Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahitika Punyantang anomo ditva chirang rakam tu desanam Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahitika Punyantang anomo ditva Sirang Rakantu Tang Sadam